welcome again to everybody, a special welcome to our guests. Uh, we're so excited that we have Christine DeWindell here with us as our featured speaker today. And as part of that, I wanted to say a special welcome to Christine's parents, Ferdinand and Monique Seafried, if you'll please stand. Ferdinand, in addition to leading a very successful industrial real estate firm, has also served for 31 or more years, I believe, as the honorary Austrian consulate up until just recently when he turned over that distinction to his son, Paul. And Monique uh, is extremely involved in the international community in her own right with dual citizenship in France and heading up the um, a commissioner with the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. Um, clearly, this is a family that has spent decades serving and advancing our international business community here in Atlanta, and we are so grateful for that and so grateful to hear about that next chapter that, that Christine is heading up. So uh, welcome again. Um, also happy and excited to welcome the much much awaited Sagar Badvi, if you will stand, where is Sagar? He may be out working in the hall. <laughs> Sagar is our, our visiting international student from Australia. You will see him. If you don't see him now, he'll be helping us. There he is, I think, in the back. See Sagar Badvi, if you'll just wave. Hi, Sagar. And then we have a guest of John Yates, Eleanor Stone, if Eleanor can please stand. Welcome, Eleanor. Also with Morris Manning Martin. A few announcements. A reminder first to please sign in with the QR code on your table. You'll be hearing a lot about QR codes today, so this will get everybody warmed up on the topic. If you have any trouble, please don't hesitate to ask your neighbor for help signing in. Also, my standing COVID reminder to please wear masks when you're not otherwise eating, drinking, or at the podium. And I really encourage us to um, hold off on our handshakes and use our fist bumps or our no-touch approach in the interim while we're really working hard to, to take care of the health and safety of our fellow members. Appreciate so much everybody's cooperation with that. And finally, uh, just be sure to mark your calendars for Monday, September 27th for our first ever Rotary on the Road. Billy Levine will be leading us over to Mercedes-Benz Stadium where we will hear from the new Falcons general manager and have a heavy behind the scenes tour of the stadium. You won't wanna miss it, it's gonna be a lot of fun and uh, the reservation link will be coming out soon. We now have a new member introduction. Allison Dukes will introduce new member Richard Hare. Thank you. I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Richard as our new member, and I also want to thank his other sponsors, Glenn Mitchell and Jenna Kelly. Uh, Richard was appointed the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Haverty's uh, about four years ago. And most of you probably know of Haverty's. Haverty's is a furniture retailer with about 100 stores, over 100 stores, in 16 states across the Southeast and Texas and Mid-Atlantic. But some of you may not know that Haverty's very first store was opened in 1885, just a few blocks from where we are sitting right now, here in downtown Atlanta. And that makes Haverty's one of Atlanta's oldest and most successful companies. I have the pleasure of serving on the board of Haverty's, which is how I've gotten to know Richard over the last few years. Prior to joining Haverty's in 2017, Richard was with Carmike Cinemas for 10 years, and he served as their chief financial officer as well, until Carmike was acquired by AMC Entertainment Holdings in 2016. And I'm pretty sure if we asked Richard, would he rather be the CFO of a furniture retailer enjoying one of the greatest home improvement booms ever uh, through the pandemic, or does he wish he was still the CFO of a movie theater business trying to figure out how to operate in a pandemic? I'm pretty sure he's gonna say he made the right choice coming to join us at Haverty's four years ago. 
Uh, Richard also serves on the board of directors of Gray Television here in Atlanta, where he is the chair of the Nominating and Governance Committee, and he's also a member of the Audit Committee. He's an emeritus member of the Dean's Advisory Council at the Harvard College of Business at Auburn University. He previously served as the chair of the board <coughs> of trustees of the River Center for the Performing Arts in Columbus, Georgia, and he served on the board of the Columbus Symphony Orchestra, among numerous other civic engagements. He holds an MBA from Vanderbilt University, my alma mater, and a BS in accounting from Auburn University. He is a war eagle through and through. Richard and his wife Charlotte have two daughters, Catherine and Margaret. Catherine's a rising senior at Furman University, and Margaret is a uh, new senior at the Levitt School here in Atlanta. Uh, Margaret is a currently exploring her college choices, and uh, the fun fact about Richard is that as she is looking at, I think most closely, UGA, Virginia, and Alabama right now, uh, Richard's really struggling with that last <laughs> choice. So he very much enjoyed accompanying Margaret to, uh, to Athens and to Charlottesville, but he let his wife have the honors for the trip to Tuscaloosa. He is not prepared to ever say roll, roll Tide, and he is uh, debating whether or not he'll be willing to write a tuition check to uh, Alabama. So I think we're hoping for Georgia or Virginia. And with that, let me let Richard say a little bit about himself. Well, thank you very much, Allison, for that, that kind introduction, and, and thank you for, for uh, sponsoring me. I'd also like to just thank Jenna Kelly and Glenn Mitchell, my other co-sponsors. And Glenn, I believe I saw on social media you had a birthday over the weekend, so happy birthday. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this organization, and I'm looking forward to uh, serving the community. Here is your official pen. Welcome to Rotary. And as you probably know, you're joining one of the largest chapters in the United States, one of the largest Rotary clubs in the United States, and a global organization with over a million volunteers. Um, I know we are so excited to get to know you better, and uh, I have to say, on a personal note, I went to Chapel Hill, my brother went to Duke. We try not to let it stand between us, so I wish you the best with your family decision, and welcome to Rotary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so a few weeks ago, you may remember uh, that we talked about how Rotary is giving us the opportunity to get informed, to team up, and to mobilize to do something great for the city of Atlanta. You might also remember that we acknowledge that the real secret sauce of Rotary is all of you, the members in this room. We have about 500 amazing leaders from all parts of the city, and yet we also know that we are at our strongest when we can do things together as a team. So we've started spending some time building that connective tissue to bring us all closer together to get to know one another even better. Jim Reed has just hosted, for example, the first of our small group dinners with our diplomatic corps. And you just heard about the first and upcoming Rotary on the Road program that will be happening in about a month. And today, I'm excited to kick off our new Rotary Roundtable series. So here's how it works. In a minute, I am going to ring the bell, and that will begin the start of the conversation. I will give you about eight or nine minutes at your table to talk about a question that I'm about to share with you. The only rule is that the group at your table, talk together, and everyone gets a chance to speak. There's no report out. There's no wrong answer. It's just a conversation to get to know each other around a common topic. So please be sure to introduce yourself and just let everybody know who you are, what you do, and then we'd love to hear your thoughts on this question. So here's the question. What is one of the best leadership lessons you have learned over the course of the pandemic. What is one of the best leadership lessons you have learned over the course of the pandemic? And, if, and by the way, if you're at a small table and want to join others to, to have a broader group, please feel free to shift your seats around. All right, see you in a few minutes.
I'm so sorry to have to, to cut things off. Uh, you, you all may be like our table where we, we just got going and I know we could have kept going for quite a while, but hopefully this will be the beginning of many additional conversations and new friendships and I look forward to circling back in the, the weeks ahead as we do another one of these roundtable conversations and, uh, and continue this series. So thank you for helping us with the pilot today. Uh, I now have the, um, the opportunity to introduce John Yates, who will introduce our key speaker today, Christine DeWindle. We all know John. He's been a terrific, long-standing leader in Rotary, also serves as senior partner at Morris Manning & Martin. John has been a mentor to so many successful entrepreneurs in this community, and he's really become our go-to guy that we call on whenever we want to create a very exciting program about where the tech industry is headed. Don, once again, you have done it today. Uh, we're very excited to hear your conversation with Christine and, and really appreciate your continuing to give us a vision of the future. So I'll turn it over to you, John and Christine. Well, thank you, President Catherine. And it's great to be here today to introduce Christine DeWendel. And also great to have your parents here, Christine. So thank you for joining us today. And when you think about the technology community and you think about entrepreneurs, I oftentimes go down a checklist, and that checklist includes serial entrepreneurs, international connections, ability to be multicultural, an understanding of new technologies like e-commerce, and an ability to adapt to changes within the business community. And we're very fortunate today that when I go down that checklist, Christine DeWendel checks each one of those boxes. Christine is a native Atlantan, and I'm going to have her tell her story to you because it's, it's fascinating. But it's an excellent example, Christine, of what can take place in Atlanta and how people come back to Atlanta. So, Christine, thank you for joining us. And maybe start the story out by telling about how you started here in Atlanta. What's the, what's the Atlanta connection, and how did you start from there? Thanks, John, and thanks, everyone, for welcoming me today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my story is the story from a girl from Atlanta who left when I was 18 um, and thought I would never come back. And uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that journey's been about. I was born here uh, up the street in Buckhead. My two parents are here, which is fun and unusual, so uh, exciting for me. I uh, went to the international school, left to go to Georgetown, and when I was 18, like a lot of kids from Atlanta thought that I was going to go do exciting things and thought my hometown was not the coolest place to be. Um, so I moved to DC, uh, fell in love with my study abroad boyfriend. So that's a, that, I'm, I'm that story, that cliche. And uh, he lived in Paris. And so when I left college, I had to find an alibi to move to Paris to be in the same city uh, as that guy and to convince my parents it was a good idea. So I started my career at Bain in Paris as a management consultant, uh, then uh, in Paris, loved it, but then decided it was probably time to uh, introduce my husband to a little bit of the American flavor. And he said, fine, but never Atlanta. I'm a Parisian, I'm not moving to Atlanta. So we moved to New York for a couple years. Um, I did my MBA at INSEAD uh, and then uh, started my career in Paris on the e-commerce digital side. And uh, when John talks about my experience taking the boxes as a serial entrepreneur, the biggest chunk of my career has been the last 11 years where I've been scaling e-commerce unicorns in Europe. So um, I joined at very early stage a company called Zalando, which is uh, a fashion e-commerce player, 26 billion market cap today. Um, and I started their French business and ran it for seven years. It was a fabulous story. I had uh, three kids while I was there, so I always say it's my fourth baby. Um, and we IPO'd, huge success, extremely high paced. And uh, when my third baby came along, I said, I have to stop traveling every week. The headquarters was in Berlin and I was on an EasyJet flight. For those of you who have flown EasyJet in Europe, it's miserable. Flying at 5 a.m. every Monday morning to Berlin where most of my team was. And so I said, let me change. And I joined uh, this time a home improvement uh, startup, very small, about 80 people. 
um, as COO. They were doing their series C with General Atlantic. They needed to hire a seasoned chief uh, operating officer. And I spent three fabulous th years there. Uh, we grew the company from about 100 million while I was there to uh, two billion uh, when I left three years later. So for those of you who are running hyper growth businesses, 100 to two billion in, in three years was, was quite a ride. We went from 100 people to about 850 people. And uh, just to make sure life never gets boring, uh, my husband and I decided it was high time to move our three very Parisian kids uh, to America. We wanted them to have the optimism, the self-esteem, the confidence that comes with you know, growing up in America. And uh, we pulled out a map and we said, all right, where are we gonna move? We want, uh, we want to, to grow our family here. I wanna start a business. I've been right next to Unicorn Founders for 10 years. Um, it's about time I start my own company and build my own tech unicorn, hopefully a unicorn. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And um, so we looked at the map and we said, all right, do we move to California? Do we move to New York? And uh, all fingers pointed to Atlanta. The, Atlanta was the place we should go. And uh, I'll tell you, after 10 years in Paris, which is an exhilarating town to live in, uh, even my very Parisian husband said, all right, we're gonna do Atlanta. And so why did we choose Atlanta? And so this is something that John has asked me about and, and we talked about it um, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, the first one is Atlanta has a booming tech scene and uh, to hire engineers, uh, it's, it's a great place to be. Uh, cost of living is less expensive than other cities like the California cities or New York. And, um, and people started to tell me, you know, the, the Atlanta business community is a very welcoming community and it's gonna be easy to do business in Atlanta. And I spoke to some of you out here in the room. Sheffield was very helpful. Jeff was very helpful, I, you know. Um, and everyone said, you know, At Atlanta's gonna be a good town to do it. So I started working on a business, and um, and that's where Sunday comes in, which is now the business I'm running, um, which I officially started in March, so it's uh, about five months old, and uh, it's a QR payment company, so it fits right nicely into the Atlanta payment scene. It's a tech company, uh, and it targets the hospitality industry. And, um, and so by moving to Atlanta for that business, I'm ticking the hospitality box because we have some fantastic hospitality groups here. The tech box um, and also, frankly, a really great place to start a new business. So we'll talk about Sunday a little bit later, but that's a little bit about the journey. And I'll tell you from a personal perspective, moving here with three young kids, um, they're all three at the international school, it has been phenomenal. Um, the weather, um, that's an easy one because we moved from Paris has been great, but just even in the pandemic, um, I've become an absolute ambassador for Atlanta, and uh, any, any dinner you meet me at, it, whether it be it New York, in Paris, or in Atlanta, I'm gonna tell people this is the place to be. So, so I think when it comes to takeaways, and we're gonna have several of them today, um, Katie, the Metro Atlanta Chamber can uh, take away Christine as one of the biggest spokespersons for the city of Atlanta when it comes to technology, because you could have looked at any city. I think New York was a city that you were, you were talking about. And in response to the question today, too, it was interesting, Christine, you might share with, with the audience some of the things that the pandemic has brought about because you're a multicultural business, but Atlanta has talent, but you also found some benefits as a result of some of the technology coming out of the pandemic to hire. Tell us a little bit about the hiring plans you have currently and why Atlanta is beneficial in that regard. Absolutely, so Sunday is this new company which we founded in the FinTech space. Uh, we're doing payments with QR codes, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but hiring, we're now 130 people, so in the last four months, we've hired 130 people in Atlanta, New York, London, Paris, and Madrid. And um, we've done it at a pretty impressive speed, and I was saying earlier, it's thanks to technology, uh, because we're able to go through a hiring cycle in a week, because we're meeting everyone on Zoom, uh, we're not meeting people in person anymore. And 18 months ago, I would have told everyone in this room, there is no way you can hire a CFO or a COO and not meet them in person. Uh, and now I have a stellar team, probably some of the best talent I've ever run across in my, in my career. And uh, I haven't met some of them in person. We've just been working uh, remotely. And so technology has been an incredible accelerator. That being said, we are trying to create hubs because we do see the value in getting people around the table just like we're doing today. So we have an office here in Atlanta at the Atlanta Tech Village, which has been a, a great headquarters to get into that tech community. We have an office in New York and um, 
technology is accelerating, but we do say let's try to keep people in regional clusters. So we've just opened up about 30 software engineer positions um, on the East Coast. And my plan is to focus them in Atlanta because we have such great tech talent coming out of Georgia State, coming out of Georgia Tech. And so the idea is to create that hub around here. So even if people are working remotely and we can move really quickly, we can get them together uh, once a week, like you do on Mondays, or you know probably every two weeks, and, and create a real corporate culture, even though people are working remote. So second takeaway is if you have a child that is an engineer looking for a job, Christine is hiring. Call so, me. Um, and it's great, too, because it's so important for us to have the talent to stay here. Now, Christine, you talked about payments. And another box on this uh, that has to be checked when it comes to serial entrepreneurs and fintech in this city is payments. We're, we've been known as a payment processing capital, maybe of the world. So maybe tell us a little bit more about Sunday, how it came about, but how it's also a payments company and how you're evolving into that. Absolutely. So. Sunday, in a nutshell, is a way to pay in restaurants in 10 seconds. We are building the fastest way in the world to pay in restaurants. So today, every one of you has gone through the painful experience of raising your arm, waiting for the check, waiting for it to come, giving your credit card up to someone you don't know um, in a pandemic era, having lots of people touch it, um, and then bring it back. You don't know exactly what's happened to that card. And that process has taken, on average, 12 minutes. Um, if you have a business lunch, if you have small screaming children who need to get out of the restaurant, being able to pay faster is a huge added value. And just about every other industry has transformed the way payments work. So think today of how you pay in a cab, um, what Uber has done to payments. Now everyone is used to paying in a, in, a, in a heartbeat. And we said, let's do the same thing for the restaurant industry, and then let's transform the way people pay in physical retail across the whole experience. And so we're starting with restaurants, we're moving into hotels, and then uh, you could even imagine parking garages, uh, physical retail. How do you stop that waiting experience? And today it starts with a QR code, so you all have QR codes on the table. You need to have good Wi-Fi for it to work, so uh, that's one of the challenges. Um, but the way we work is we provide payments for these restaurants. There's another element, especially for Atlanta as a payment town, is that today, I'll be very you know, frank with you, uh, payment processing fees are highway robbery. In America, you hopefully know this, but restaurants, hospitality industry pay 3% on average to uh, Amex and uh, Visa, MasterCard, and payment processing companies. And nobody has come into that space and said, wait a minute, 3%? I mean, that's an enormous impact on your bottom line. How can we transform that? So we're coming into this industry saying, we come from the hospitality industry, and so my, my co-founder is a restaurant owner, and we're gonna disrupt the way people pay in restaurants. And we are going to build a, a technology that's gonna let us process payments, but not go through the traditional channels. And that's where Atlanta is really interesting because there is a lot of payment processing here, and I'm about to start partnering with some of these Atlanta players um, where we can, start thinking about how we deconstruct this payment industry, um, which hasn't been shaken up, frankly, in 40 years. And so Sunday is out to do that, starting with the hospitality industry. I think what you'll see, too, as a takeaway is that payments is one of the areas that, from an investor standpoint, is one of the hottest areas. We have a lot of folks here that are involved in, in the payments field, in the fintech area. And certainly that's, uh, that makes your company very, very interesting. So Christine, we talked about international as a box that's checked. So tell us a little bit about some of the multicultural issues. You have a multicultural co-founder. You have multiple offices throughout the world. And you started that way with the business. So it, it's unlike many early startup technology companies that say, yes, we'll get around to international someday. But you actually came right out of that. Now, maybe you have an advantage because you have parents that have connections in Austria and France, and you went to international school, so you may be multilingual, but talk about some of the challenges of a multicultural business, and maybe give folks a takeaway here, if they're thinking about expanding their business internationally, what you found were some of the ways that you did that. So when we decided to start this company, Victor and I, my, my co-founder, who's he's based in London, he's French, we said, let's build a FinTech. The potential is enormous. Um, but we can't be just another European fintech uh, because European fintechs and European tech startups in general rarely cross the Atlantic. 
And in order to really become a, a giant, it's very tough for a European company to start in Europe and then move to the US. And why? Because frankly, for Europeans, it's quite intimidating to come to the US and they don't know how to navigate the US. Uh, hiring culture is different. Uh, salaries are much higher. Um, people's stance on equity is much higher and, and, and more aggressive. And so from the outset, we said, you know what, we're gonna do something which frankly, no early stage startup has tried to do in this scale is we're gonna start in Europe and the US at the same time. That's also why we raised 24 million in our seed round. It's, it's the biggest seed round there's ever been in Europe and it's probably the second seed round there's ever been in the US. Um, we, we showed up to our investors uh, with a PowerPoint presentation and a great story and a big smile and we said we wanna raise 24 million on 140 million valuation. And instead of the investors saying to us, you guys are nuts, why would we ever give you 140 million valuation? They said, you are bold enough to say you need to go in the US and Europe at the same time and you're building a leadership team which is equipped to move into those two markets at the same time. And why not Asia? Because frankly, Asia is so advanced on QR code payment that we're just playing catch up with what's been going on for the past 10 years in Asia. And so our ambition was to say, let's build a hundred billion dollar company. And you can laugh at me, but hopefully I'll come back in five years and I'll be somewhere near to that journey. And, and let's build it in the US and in Europe at the same time. That comes with a bunch of challenges. Um, there's language challenges, right? Um, English is our common language, but um, we need to push people. You know, our Slack, for those of you who use Slack, is in Spanish, it's in French, um, it's in English, and I need to remind people every day that we need to, you know, be communicating in English because we need a common language. Um, Work-life balance, very different. Europeans right now are all on vacation, and my American team writes to me every morning and says, are you for real? All Europeans are gone for three weeks? And I said, that's the way, I just came back from two weeks in Sicily, so I'm, I'm, I'm right in that, in that bucket. And I said to the American team, I'm gonna teach you that you could take three weeks off in August, or two weeks, um, you, can, you can do it, and we can still build you know, a billion dollar company. However, um, the Europeans are working late every night, and uh, they're up earlier, and, uh, and they're not driving their kids to basketball practice on Thursday afternoons because you know, that just doesn't fit. So there's, a, there's a, a mix and match to be done with, with the cultural divide. Another good example is feedback. Um, Americans are fantastic at feedback. Amer Europeans are terrible at it. And so we're trying to pick and choose the best things of every culture. And so right now I've got everyone on my team reading a book which I highly recommend called Radical Candor and it's about giving feedback, telling people when things are going well or not. And the Europeans cringe when I start a meeting and say, okay, can you give me feedback about you know, how I'm doing as a manager? They say, oh, that's the worst thing you could ever ask me to do. I say, well, you're gonna learn because that's how we're gonna improve. So for the, the Europeans are trying to teach the, the Americans on you know, taking more time off and you know, working really hard when they're working hard, but enjoying life as much as they can um, when they're not working. And the Americans are giving that high energy, get it done, um, strong feedback culture to the Europeans. And frankly, the mix is explosive. It is a ton of fun because in any given meeting, I have people from two continents who don't know each other, they've never met, and uh, th they're building a multi-billion you know, uh, billion company together and they're excited to be doing it. So right now, the energy is, is incredible, thanks to that multicultural mix. Well, and I think every company is becoming a technology company. I see PJ Bain from Prime Revenue, I saw PJ nodding his head when it came to the international because you have a very strong international operation. Many, many technology companies do. Baja, you probably be joining Azalea as it expands internationally. But most people don't say it's a ton of fun right away. So I think what you have is you've given some very keen insights. So you've accepted a lot of the multicultural differences and haven't necessarily tried to force every one of these offices to actually adopt American, the American culture. Um, which is, which is challenging. Have you, when you did that, just maybe to put another uh, point on that, did you find someone in that particular country to go run that operation in that country or are you there having a contact? Because that oftentimes is a challenge. When you go into another country, how do you go about it? What are the takeaways people should take from what your experience is? And that's a great point, John. Because culture is so important in building uh, a FinTech like this, we're, we're going fast and for those of you who have worked with tech companies, if the culture isn't good, people don't stay. 
it's so competitive, it's so tough to hire good talent that we need to be above and beyond on culture. People need to love working for us. And so how do you build that culture? Well, we've been very careful in the 130 hires we've made in the past three, four months to hire a general manager for each country who is very much aligned with Victor and I's values. And so my co-founder, Victor, is coming from the hospitality industry. Uh, both of us have three young kids. Both of us said, we're gonna build this company, but it's gotta be fun. We've gotta have time to spend uh, with our families, with our loved ones. We have time for our hobbies. And if we can't make that work, um, then we're failing as a company. And so that's, that's a given uh, set of rules that we look for when we're hiring um, you know, top managers. And you know, this may shock you, but we have a no asshole rule. And so we're not hiring the best person in the industry if he's not you know, gonna be empathetic, friendly, and if he doesn't get people excited, right? You wanna be hiring someone who you as much wanna be seated at a dinner and you're gonna have fun and you're gonna wanna have three cocktails with them than someone who's an excellent executor. It's easier when you raise 24 million on a seed round because you can give people big equity stakes and pay them well and tell them a great story. And so each general manager lives the culture we're looking for, right? We want people who are lifestyle oriented. We want people who are passionate and who have a great track record. And so far, so good. Let's see if that works. But you know, when, when we get all our general managers for New York, we're looking for a general manager for the Southeast. So if you have any ideas, I'm, I'm looking for someone. <laughs> Um, we, we really look for people who have as much of that human culture as they have the business excellence. And, uh, you know, four months in, it's working well. So $24 million in your seed round, probably one of the largest seed rounds ever in the United States and in Europe, off of a PowerPoint presentation. Um, what's the takeaway here for folks when it comes to raising early stage capital? Was it because of your seasoned experience generally in e-commerce? Was it because of your success in business? Was it because of your knowledge of the restaurant and QR code market? What, what is it that caused investors, very notable investors, to put $24 million in a company that was effectively a PowerPoint presentation? So there's three things. One is the team, second is the level of the ambition, and uh, three is the speed of execution at which we we're planning to do it. So on the team, um, it may be a little cliche, but you know, my co-founder and I are very complimentary. I'm a, you know, a, a girl from, a blonde woman from Atlanta uh, who's got 15 years of tech experience, um, and I've had the track record of building unicorns very quickly. And he's a charismatic French male um, who's been building restaurants for the past 10 years. And so investors love that complimentary mix. Um, and you don't see a lot of, you know, female entrepreneurs with male entrepreneurs, cross-cultural, cross-industry, with a great track record. So that was already, I would say, half the round. They loved the story of they're investing in a team. The second piece is how big the vision is. We came in there, arrogantly maybe so, and we said we can build a $100 billion business. Square did it. Um, Stripe is doing it. Um, our vision is big enough. And how is it big? It's because we're going to go in North America and in Europe at the same time. Um, and we're gonna start with hospitality because we have a real story to tell, but then we can see how you could change the way people pay throughout all of retail. What PayPal has done for e-commerce or what Venmo has done for peer-to-peer, -peer, we said, and, and we may not get there, right? I mean, we have to stay humble, but we said we could see how big the vision is, so give us the money and we're gonna prove to you that we could do it. And then the third, the third thing is we said, we know how to beat the drum fast enough uh, that we can we can get to, to big numbers quickly. And so to give you an idea, we're, we're live since four months. We're tra tra tracking at about 100 million annual transaction volume, um, you know, in a couple months, and, and that's fast, right? We're live in, in four markets uh, with teams up and running, and we have 1,000 restaurants who have signed on, uh, which represents about a billion in annual transaction volume, and that's just in a couple months. So. So we went in there saying we could reach those targets and we're gonna work relentlessly and we're gonna have the grit to do it. And it is tough. Um, sometimes I feel like it's like eating gravel and I'm up late at night and my parents are taking care of the kids. Um, but we're getting there and, um, and that's what's fun about it and that's what's giving everyone energy. So you got a big vision. 
And I think you pointed out that when you go to raise capital, you share that big vision, you have a senior team, you're experienced, and in this case, they put $24 million in the company. But talk a little bit to the group about, you know, you talked about QR codes, you talk about the nature of the business. Is it somewhat of a land grab? And how are you going about, you know, actually going to market here? In other words, what should people think about when they go to a restaurant and they see, a, they see the QR code and they, are they going to see a Sunday logo? How are they going to know that they're involved? And how do you go about finding those restaurants and getting into particularly the United States? So our business model is we need to get on as many tables as possible. And we take a tiny cut on the transaction volume that's going through there. So a tiny cut that's about uh, 10 to 20 basis points, 0.1%. And that's classic fintech. You take a tiny, tiny margin, but you do such big volumes that that ends up uh, bringing you revenue. And then you monetize the data. Um, so what are we doing? Well, we have sales teams on the ground. And um, we go and call the restaurants. And we tell them we have an awesome solution and that they should sign up because we're going to save their wait staff 15 minutes. We're going to increase their tips. And we are part of the digital revolution, which is changing the way people work in restaurants. Um, in the US, it is tough because we don't have the track record. So my, my big victory last week is we got Bucket Life Group on board. So in a couple weeks, all of you will hopefully be uh, having dinner at Chops or at Preachy's, and you'll be able to pay with Sunday. And what does it look like? Well, on your table, you'll have a QR code on which you can scan the menu, and most of you have probably scanned menus with a QR code in the past 18 months since the pandemic hit. But when you scan that QR code, you'll not only be able to see the menu, but you'll also be able to pay. And it pulls up your bill, and we'll know that Jeff got a cappuccino, a steak, and a glass of red wine, and we'll know that Sheffield got a Caesar salad. Um, and uh, if they're dining together, they can split the bill. Um, they can add a tip, and they can be out of the restaurant in five minutes, uh, in 10 seconds, frankly, much faster than they were before. Um, so we have sales teams. I'm working with the strategic brands. We're signing with a uh, quality brand in New York. That's Smith & Walensky. And then we have our sales teams who are doing a fantastic job. It's hard work door to door, calling every restaurant in Atlanta, making sure we're integrated into their point of sales. So we're starting to work with NCR. Um, I'm still trying to convince uh, Revel here in Atlanta to get on board, but we're working with all the big point of sale systems and our sales teams go door to door. And, and that's how we get in a couple months to a thousand restaurants signed. Um, but it's, it's tough. It's not, it's not as easy as you can imagine. So Christine, tell us also one thing's very interesting. You're capturing a lot of data here. All right. And so Atlanta, in addition to being a fintech and a payment processing community, is a data analytics community. Tell us how data fits into this and how that may change the way your business is different from other businesses that may be doing some similar kinds of things. So our big vision is to say, if we start helping you pay faster and you get that operational benefit, we're going to be able to know more about you and we're gonna be able to customize your restaurant experience and your retail experience. So John, next time, if, if you have a shellfish allergy, or no, you do, um, next time you go to a restaurant and you pull up that menu, um, we shouldn't be telling you about the specials that are with shellfish, right? Um, and if we know that you love a glass of Bordeaux on Friday nights, then that should be the first thing we're pitching to you. And today the restaurant industry is one of the last places where even if you go to Houston's every Wednesday for lunch, they have no idea unless they recognize you because they don't have information on you. And so our idea is as we gain market share and we see you go through your restaurant experience, obviously if you want it and you've accepted the privacy details because we, you know, we're very careful about that, we can offer you a better experience uh, because we know what you like. And that's better for the restaurant and it's better for the end consumer. So I think we're going to open up the questions in just a second. So think about your questions. But Christine, I want to ask this as a takeaway as well. You've made it work where you've been an entrepreneur, a successful serial entrepreneur, multiple companies, um, a mother, a wife, three kids. And you talk about a culture that wants to allow people to have a comfortable life at the same time. How did you make it work, especially when your parents were here in Atlanta and you were in France, you were there for at least a decade. You know, what, did, what were some of the experiences you came away with there that have helped you in building the culture now, especially for people that have young kids, which is becoming more challenging as we come out of the pandemic and people have been used to being at home with their kids? 
so for me, it's, it's your support network. It's my husband, who's a rock star um, and who does a wonderful job with kids. Um, even when he's you know, busy, he's, he's fantastic. It's the grandparents. Um, mom's been in Atlanta, but she's been flying for every school vacation to France to take care of my kids, so a big shout out to her. Um, and you know the people, at my fantastic au pairs. Um, I always tell this to young women, but I should also tell this to young dads, that if you can get quality people around you to help you, it takes a village uh, to build a startup and, and to run a family, but if you get the right people surrounding you, it's, it's just a pleasure. And so it's, it's about that support. Great points. I think ready to open some questions. Yeah, Catherine. we have time for a couple questions. Let's see, right here? Or, yeah, we've got a mic here too. Just want to make sure our recorded video hears all the questions. Hi, thank you. Can you walk us through the mechanics of the flow of funds from the client to the restaurant? Absolutely. So the way Sunday works <coughs> is we're working with one of the largest payment processors in the world called Stripe. Um, we're part, we've partnered with Stripe because they can support us in all markets. And that was very important to get to market quickly. And that's part of the success we need. So how does it work? When you scan that QR code, you get the check. Um, you can pay with Apple Pay. You can pay with Google Pay, with your Amex, with your MasterCard, whatever it is. Either it's saved in your phone or you can type it in. Um, Stripe uh, processes the payment. And uh, we pay the restaurant uh, every 24 hours. And so every 24 hours, the restaurant is getting um, a payment from us um, that's gone through Stripe. And um, we make sure they get it in 24 hours because it's really important for restaurants working capital to get that money. Um, in the meantime, our accounting flows are perfectly aligned with the restaurant's accounting flows that's built into their point of sale system so they know exactly how much it's been and you know, what items, et cetera. Um, and then what we do is we, when we pay them, we take that small cut um, when they're getting paid on the, on the, the after 24 hours. So if it's a $100 check and we're getting 0.1%, the restaurant is getting paid the day after, and we take that 0.1% check. So if it's sold through Amex, yeah. you have a better deal with Amex than the restaurant situation. It depends. If it's a very big restaurant that has a great uh, CFO who's negotiated good prices, we'll have a similar rate. If it's a smaller restaurant, we consistently have better rates because we're, we have such big volumes. And so part of our deal with Stripe is to get group volumes where we're processing hundreds of millions, um, which means we have better rates with credit card processing company, with credit cards and you know, scheme fees and interchange fees than restaurants. So our price is generally more affordable for small restaurants than if they were using regular payment processing fees that they have negotiated. For larger groups, for enterprise accounts, um, right now we're still negotiating to make sure they're getting benefits from the operational efficiency, but it's hard for us to beat those prices. 12 months from now, we'll probably be at a, a, a situation where we can charge even lower rates, but right now we usually do it at cost just to gain market share. That's a great question. So Sunday, the whole point of our company is to save time for what matters. And I talked about the importance of our culture and our values and spending time with loved ones. And we said if we really make this company work, then people are gonna save 10, 12 minutes every time they go out, every time they wait in, you know, in line. And so what do we do with the time where we save time for what matters? Well, Sunday is the day of the week um, where we do things that that we love and that matters. So there was a little bit of a play on what's our favorite day of the week, because that's when we actually get time to benefit from the time that we've saved. Uh, we also needed a name that works in four languages and hopefully tomorrow in 20 languages. And um, there was a little, it's Sunday like the day of the week, but we also, you know, we're big ice cream fans and we thought it was fun to have a play on. Everyone likes Sunday, so people know it, it's easy to spell. It has great connotations and everyone smiles when they hear the word Sunday. And the story behind it is we're here to help people save time for what matters. And Sunday is the day of the week where we do what matters to us. Christine, I have a question. Um, you have been part of so many exciting ventures and now with your own. I'm curious to hear your source of creative inspiration. How do you feed your vision and continue to, to stay active with all of these great ideas? 
so the three fast-growing businesses I've been heavily involved in um, have all been very simple concepts. Uh, Zalando was fashion e-commerce, so how do you order shoes online, um, the same way Zappos does. Uh, Mano Mano is home improvement online. How do I not have to go to Home Depot on Saturday uh, to buy something, and how can I get it delivered to my house? And Sunday is how do I get my screaming children out of a restaurant in 10 seconds um, when I really need to go? And so everything I've worked on looks like a really simple product market fit, which is something I get. Um, I'm, I'm not a particularly you know, sophisticated engineer. I, I don't get into the details. I like the big picture, and I like something that's easy to understand. And so paying in 10 seconds in a restaurant without asking for the check, that was easy. So I'm always looking for everyday pain points and how can you improve them? And then based on that, how can you build a business? And so, so far, so good. Great. All right, I think, I think we're out of time. It's so inspiring to hear your story, Christine, and I'm excited to hear and see the trajectory that you're on. Thank you so much for being with us. And John, fantastic questions as always. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much.